All right, we'll now begin our review of medical nutrition therapy for renal disorders. So let's talk a little bit about the anatomy of the kidneys. So again, you have two kidneys, the right and left kidney, and each is approximately the size of a fist. And so in essence, if you were to make your fist and then put them right above the small of your back, um, that would be approximately the location of each kidney. So each kidney does consist of 1.2 million nephrons. Now you'll recall that when we were speaking about the liver, we were talking about lobules as the smallest functional unit of the liver. A nephron is the smallest functional unit of the kidney. And so the kidneys do participate in a number of regulatory and metabolic functions. Now each nephron will take a look at its structure as made up of a glomerulus and a network of tubules. Now the kidney as a whole has three main sections. That is the cortex, the outer medulla, and the inner medulla. The tubules consist of different segments. You have the proximal convoluted tubule. Here we have uncontrolled reabsorption and secretion of selected substances. The loop of Henle, which establishes an osmotic gradient in the renal medulla that is important in the kidney's ability to produce urine of varying concentration. You have the distal convoluted tubule where we have controlled reabsorption of sodium and water, the secretion of potassium and hydrogen ions. And finally, we have the collecting duct where the fluid leaving is in the form of urine. The glomerulus is a network of thin walled capillaries closely surrounded by a pear shaped epithelial membrane called the Bauman's capsule. Now we also have the afferent arteriole which carries blood to the glomerulus and the efferent arteriole which carries blood away from the glomerulus. An easy way to remember these is that the efferent is making its escape or it's leaving the glomerulus. Here we can see the structure of the nephron where again you can see the initial proximal convoluted tubule. You can see the loop there at the bottom. It ascends where you can see the glomerulus and from there you can see the distal convoluted tubule and then finally the collecting duct. And here you have a little bit more detail. And I think you can see, again, looking at the tissue, and you can also see the capillaries. And so again, it makes a lot of sense when we talk about the filtering of the blood, and then also why diseases that affect the blood and the blood pressure affect the kidneys. You'll see a little bit more as we go through the lecture. I think this anatomy kind of identifies why that occurs. So again, here you can see the kidneys. Um, again, they're probably a little bit higher up than you imagine. Um, so again, imagine the small of your back, but then go up. And so again, let's talk about some of those functions of the kidneys. So again, we know that the kidneys participate in maintaining homeostasis, and they do this by affecting fluid balance, pH regulation, electrolyte balance, blood pressure, which again relates to fluid, the excretion of metabolic end products and foreign substances, and the production of specific enzymes and hormones. So first we'll talk a little bit about the ability to concentrate fluid, and again looking at the way we regulate fluid balance and urine excretion. So we have what's known as ultrafiltrate. And so the kidney receives 20% approximately of cardiac output and filters approximately 1,600 liters of blood per day, producing 180 to 200 milliliters of ultrafiltrate. Now, obviously, given the fact that you have a little more than five liters of blood in your system, the 1,600 liters is indicative of the fact that this blood goes through the kidneys many, many, many times per day. Now, ultrafiltrate is the filtered fluid that consists of all the substances of the blood, except for the large proteins and blood cells. 
The production of filtrate is mainly passive and relies on perfusion pressure generated by the heart and supplied by the renal artery. So for the kidneys to function properly, we do need some pressure, right? We need a normal, healthy blood pressure, but not excessive. Now, through active processes of reabsorbing certain components and secreting others, the ultrafiltrate is converted into approximately 1.5 liters of urine per day. Again, that number is very dependent on the amount of fluid consumed, ambient temperature, etc. So here you can see again how the ultrafiltrate and then urine is actually generated. Again, so we can see the blood running through the nephron is filtered. Again, you have what's going to be excreted and then the blood is going to return through the efferent arterial. In addition to the production of urine, we also know that the regulation of fluid balance is controlled by enzymes and hormones. We specifically referred to before as vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone. So again, this is made by the hypothalamus and secreted by the pituitary, and this regulates fluid balance by affecting the kidney. So this works in the collecting duct to increase the absorption of water and to maintain plasma volume and blood pressure. So a diuretic makes you pee, an antidiuretic makes you not pee. So this hormone is going to make you not pee and hold on to water in the body. An excess of body water will be counter-regulatory and shut off vasopressin secretion. So this hormone will make you not pee. You will build up water in the blood. And once you've built up enough water, it will turn off this hormone and you will again begin excreting water through urine. Now a small rise in osmolality brings about increased vasopressin secretion and water retention. Remember that osmolality is a marker of blood concentration. So as you become dehydrated, even the slightest bit as your blood becomes more concentrated, this hormone is released, telling your kidneys to conserve water. And again, you will begin retaining water and urinating less. Now, the reason why this matters and it's in the text is there is a rare condition known as syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. So here the pituitary gland releases an excessive amount of vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone. And the common causes of this include head injury, meningitis, cancer, infection, and hypothyroidism. The most common place I would see this was in neurointensive care unit patients. And again, so this was usually due to a motor vehicle accident, um, you know, a head striking a foreign object, um, sports injuries, steering wheels, etc. cetera. Um, again, these other causes are quite possible, um, but again, we saw this most frequently in our neurointensive care unit. Now, what happens here is that we have an excessive amount of antidiuretic hormone or an excessive amount of not peeing. This causes very large volumes of water to build up in the blood. This leads to hyponatremia or low sodium due to hemodilution. And that is because you have a very large volume of water in the blood that should not be there. If untreated, this results in seizures, coma, and death. And the treatment is fluid restriction or a higher concentration sodium fluid. So normal saline, or in the ICU, we could even use up to 3%, which is about three times more concentrated than normal saline. Now, I know we've spoken briefly about this before when we were analyzing labs. Um, so we have spoken about, which is renin. So we have an enzyme, angiotensinogenase, that controls the renin-angiotensin mechanism for the regulation of blood pressure. And so here we have the reverse. A decrease in blood volume causes the cells of the glomerulus to secrete renin. 
So previously, we had hormones that were generated by the hypothalamus and released by the pituitary. But here, this renin is actually secreted by the glomerulus. So renin acts on angiotensinogen, which is the precursor to form angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2, which acts as a vasoconstrictor, and we have the stimulation of aldosterone secretion from the adrenals. Aldosterone stimulates the reabsorption of sodium and fluid, and blood pressure will return to normal. Aldosterone is produced by the adrenal cortex, which again, the adrenals sit on top of the kidneys. So again, aldosterone is focused primarily on sodium, which will pull fluid with it. Antidiuretic hormone is focused on water or fluid. So again, they're two halves to the same coin and they work together to retain fluid. Another function of the kidneys we'll talk about as a hormone is 1,25-dihydroxycholecalciferol, or calcitriol. And this is considered a hormone, but you might know this as the active form of vitamin D. So the parathyroid hormone stimulates enzymes to convert the inactive form of vitamin D to the active form in the nephron. This increases blood calcium levels by promoting absorption of dietary calcium from the GI tract and increasing renal tubular reabsorption of calcium, thus reducing the amount of calcium excreted in the urine. An additional hormone function of the kidneys is the production of erythropoietin, or EPO. So this hormone is produced in the kidneys and stimulates erythropoiesis, or the generation of red blood cells in the bone marrow. A lack of EPO, or erythropoietin, is known as anemia of chronic disease. And there's a specific pattern of anemia that we see in patients with chronic kidney disease. Based on these functions, we can look at many of these symptoms of kidney impairment. This includes sodium retention and edema leading to hypertension, metabolic acidosis as the kidneys fail to excrete hydrogen ions in the urine, hyperkalemia and hyperphosphatemia, microcytic anemia and iron deficiency. And so again, you will have small blood cells and it's what's known as anemia of chronic disease. We will also see what's known as azotemia or uremia. Again, so this is a buildup of nitrogenous waste products and urea in the blood, which is very toxic to the brain. Uh, the big difference is simply the time the physician went to medical school. Um, so you may see azotemia and uremia used interchangeably. Um, notable symptom though with that is that patients will report what's known as the itch, which is they will feel a need to scratch or itch under their skin that can't be resolved. And this is because they're being uh, poisoned by excessive amounts of urea and other nitrogenous waste products in the blood. We will also see oliguria with a urine output of less than 500 milliliters per day. This is the minimum amount needed to actually carry away or excrete waste products from the body. We also may see secondary hyperparathyroidism, bone and mineral disorders, renal osteodystrophy. And again, this is because of the inability to produce the active form of vitamin D. We will then limit calcium absorption and this long-term leads to these bone diseases. And we will obviously see a decreased glomerular filtration rate or GFR as the kidneys become damaged and decrease their, fun their filtering ability. 
So we've spoken previously in MNT1 about GFR, but as a review, this is glomerular filtration rate, or GFR, and this is the rate at which substances are cleared from plasma by the glomeruli. So this is used to evaluate kidney health or kidney function, with the normal range being 135 to 180 liters per day. Now you can see there's the Cockroft-Galt equation, which is based on age, body weight, gender, and creatinine. There's the MDRD equation, here again using serum creatinine, age, there's an adjustment factor for being African American, and there's an adjustment factor for gender. The equation's also been improved to include BUN and albumin. I have placed these equations here simply so that you are aware of them. In most lab reports, these will be provided for you. The only time I would expect you to be more knowledgeable about how to use the specific equations is if you were working in a dialysis clinic. Again, um, it would be a little bit different. You'd be looking at specific factors, etc. Um, but for general practice and for entry-level dietitians, um, I more want you to appreciate the fact that we look at waste products, gender, race, and age. And so we'll talk about uh, how those things change. For example, how age um, we know is going to lead to a decline in renal function. So previously, we had clearance calculations, which looked at the volume of a particular solute at a given time. For example, we previously used creatinine clearance. Um, this has been replaced, though, by GFR. Again, it's a more inclusive calculation, uh, not just focused on one particular solute. Other things, though, that you may see are microalbuminuria, which is looking at how much protein is leaking into the urine, tubular functional function test, microscopic evaluation of the urine, and radiological evaluation, including MRI and ultrasound, to examine the structure of the kidney, as well as possibly biopsies. So we'll take a look at some of the different diseases that affect the kidney. These include nephrolithiasis, chronic kidney disease, acute kidney injury, diseases of the tubules, glomerular diseases, end-stage renal disease, and then we'll discuss the treatment for these outcomes, which is uh, kidney transplant. So we previously spoke about cholelithiasis. We'll now talk about nephrolithiasis. So again, nephro being kidney and lithiasis being stones. So this is kidney stones. This affects approximately 1 million Americans per year. Most frequently occurs in men aged 30 to 50 years of age. Risk factors for kidney stones includes family history, being obese, having diabetes, high levels of calcium in the urine, high amounts of oxalates, and low urine volume. Other causes include gout, excessive intake of vitamin D, UTIs, and urinary tract blockages. So these stones form when calcium, oxalate, struvite, cysteine, hydroxyapatite, or uric acid in the urine is higher than normal amounts and is unable to be excreted. 60% of stones are found to be calcium oxalate. Uric acid stones are more common, though, in patients that are obese or have type 2 diabetes. And so what we see is as body weight increases, the excretion of sodium, calcium, uric acid, and citrate increases, along with a lower urine pH or a more acidic urine and decreased ammonia excretion. So as a review of the different types of stones, we have calcium stones, which are due to high amounts of calcium in the urine or genetics. This is where we were initially concerned about high animal protein intake as this lowers urine pH. So again, 
For example, choosing more dairy protein sources would lead to a more alkaline urine and possibly decreased risk. You have uric acid stones, which occur when urinary pH is less than 5.5. Again, we'll take a look at uh, alkalinity of the diet, which again, the only thing it will predominantly affect is the urine. Oxalate stones, this is due to hyperoxaluria, or high amounts of oxalates in the urine. This occurs when less calcium is available to bind the oxalate, and so we would obviously absorb, I apologize, we would obviously avoid high oxalate foods. Melamine stones, um, and so you may have heard, and this occasionally crops up in viral social media, so it'll be shared, um, or you may see this in legitimate news reports, um, what's known as melamine poisoning. Um, and so this is due to contaminated formula um, and so this occurred in some formula that had been imported from China. And so you'll now often see there's often lots of um, viral threads um, or news reports about um, the lack of production or avoiding uh, Chinese-based infant formula. Um, there was some history of contamination with melamine. There are struvite stones, which require the presence of bacteria, and cysteine stones, which can occur when the pH is less than seven. The recommendation is a high fluid intake or four liters per day. So taking a little bit more of a look at kidney stones, they are asymptomatic or they have no symptoms until a blockage occurs when the patient will develop acute pain, blood in the urine, nausea, vomiting, pain with urination, and an increased urgency to urinate. Most stones can pass with a large volume of fluid and pain medications. Um, they do have to be careful, and I'm sure many of you have heard of the extreme pain caused by kidney stones. The problem is, and as we've talked about in class, is that after significant anesthesia or narcotics, they will often not allow you to leave the hospital until you have urinated and or had a bowel movement. So the very strong narcotics will decrease the urge to urinate and defecate. So unfortunately, with kidney stones, they cannot give you the very strong narcotics as you will then be able to not, you will be unable, you will not be able to pass the stone. Other options, there are medical procedures um, so one of these that you may be familiar with is known as extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, which is a really fancy way of kind of saying like a, uh, a jacuzzi or a jackhammer from the outside will break down the stones into smaller stones, which will be easier to pass. So you will still have to pass the kidney stone, but they will be much smaller. We also have what's known as a percutaneous nephrolytomy, in which case we're going to go through the skin, in essence fillet the kidney open and remove the stone, or a ureteroscopy, in which case they're going to go through the urethra, right through the bladder to the kidney to then remove the stone. So from a nutrition standpoint, our focus is on nutrient and fluid intake. So again, especially in the acute phase, they need to pass the stone. But then long term, we're going to be taking a look at is do they have a history of stones and then 24 hour urine specimens to again look at urine pH and usual diet to again see if there's dietary causes for these kidney stones. Possible nutrition diagnoses include excessive mineral intake and inadequate fluid intake. The recommendation is increasing fluid intake to three liters per day in divided doses, 150 milligrams of calcium per meal to bind with oxalate, and limiting oxalate to 50 to 60 milligrams per day. Avoid foods that increase urinary oxalate, avoids high in purine if they're uric acid stones, and the DASH diet lowers the risk for kidney stones. So in general, this can be summed up with adequate calcium, low animal protein, and a low sodium diet with plenty of fluids. 
So here's an example of foods to avoid while on a low oxalate diet. This includes things like rhubarb, spinach, strawberries, chocolate, wheat bran, both tree nuts and peanuts, beets, tea, and high doses of turmeric. Again, here we can see the recommendations for high fluid, lower protein, adequate calcium, low oxalate, and then limiting sodium and vitamin C. All right, so we'll move from kidney stones into chronic kidney disease. So here we have a syndrome of progressive and irreversible loss of the excretory, endocrine, and metabolic functions of the kidney. So unlike type one diabetes, which only stops the function of the beta cells, chronic kidney disease will shut down all functions of this organ. So again, here we're looking at kidney function based off GFR, and chronic kidney disease does require medication, a specialized diet, and then we will discuss dialysis and that's for patients with stage five. So chronic kidney disease is ranked from stage one being the least dangerous to stage five, which indicates total kidney failure and the need for renal replacement therapy or dialysis. And so the treatment plan for that is dialysis or long-term, hopefully a transplant. So here you can see the chart and so we have stage one, which is kidney damage with normal or increased GFR. Again here, our goal is to slow the progression and keep an eye on cardiovascular disease. Stage two is mild damage. Stage three is moderate damage, in which case we will begin treating complications. Stage four is more severe damage, in which case we will continue our treatment and prepare for dialysis. Stage five is kidney failure and again, renal replacement therapy. And so here you can see there are some graphics to kind of give you an idea of what portion of the kidney is still functioning at each stage. Now what you'll see is that stage five is a GFR below 15. And so that number is key and needs to be at the recall whenever asked. Stage five is a GFR below 15. So 26 million American adults have chronic kidney disease with millions of others being at increased risk, especially when we take a look at the two leading risk factors. Now we did mention previously that age is factored in to the GFR equation and so we see approximately 1% of kidney function is lost each year after the age of 40. So the goal is to protect the kidneys as long as possible, knowing that some loss will occur with aging. Now the leading risk factors for the development of chronic kidney disease are diabetes and hypertension. And given the fact that 70% of Americans are overweight or obese, that dramatically increases the risk of diabetes hypertension, and chronic kidney disease. Other risk factors include ethnicity, family history, hereditary factors, forceful blows to the kidneys. So for example, sports, especially combat sports such as boxing, where kidney strikes are banned because of their danger, and prolonged consumption of OTC painkillers, specifically ibuprofen. And I have met multiple patients in dialysis clinics who are there due to excessive ibuprofen consumption. Now they did this because they did not want to become addicts and so they were avoiding narcotics. But ibuprofen, AKA Advil, can be very damaging to the kidneys. Symptoms of chronic kidney disease including feeling more tired and having less energy, having trouble concentrating, a poor appetite, poor sleeping, muscle cramping at night, swollen feet or ankles, 
puffiness around the eyes, especially in the morning, dry, itchy skin, and the need to urinate more often. For treatment, we seek our guidelines from what's known as the National Kidney Foundation. And so they have what's known as the Kidney Disease Outcomes Quality Initiative, or Kodoki. And so these guidelines are evidence-based practices. So what we're looking at is we know that if we consistently treat the patient this way, they will have the best possible outcomes. Now our goal is to treat the underlying disease and delay progression. So again, you'll see there's a strong focus on cardiovascular disease prevention, blood pressure management, blood glucose management, and it's very possible for patients to stay stage two or three, or even one, for very long periods of time. Now we do have medical and nutritional care that correlates based on the how advanced the renal disease is, which again is assessed based on GFR. So for example, stage one and two, we're probably giving the patient epotherapy. So again, we're encouraging them to make new blood cells and not develop anemia through synthetic EPO. We may be giving them active vitamin D or hectorol injections. Whereas at stage five, for example, they would be using renal replacement therapy and a therapeutic diet. For patients with stage five, chronic kidney disease, they will receive what's known as renal replacement therapy or dialysis. And so here we're going to have the removal of toxic byproducts from metabolism through the blood. And again, this is looking primarily at the filtering function of the kidney. So they're still going to continue with the EPO injections and with the vitamin D injections. And again, that's looking at the hormonal function of the kidney but the dialysis is focused on the filtering function of the kidneys. Now, while doing this, we still have to focus on fluid and electrolyte balance. And so we will remove these waste products through different processes known as diffusion, ultrafiltration, and osmosis. And so the blood is passed across a selective membrane, in essence, an artificial kidney, and then exposed to a rinsing fluid knowing it, known as diazolate and there are two forms of renal replacement therapy and I need you to know they are hemodialysis which is the blood and peritoneal dialysis which uses the peritoneal cavity now here you can see it uses a tea bag as an example so we have diffusion in which particles can pass through the membrane osmosis in which case water can move across the membrane. Filtration. So again, here we now have some filtration or control of what's passing through the membrane. And ultrafiltration, which uses a pressure gradient or some amount of pressure for filtering through the membrane. So again, we have a man-made dialyzer or an artificial kidney. And in essence, what they look like is they look like a coffee filter that has been folded up like a fan and stuck in a tube. And so that's the actual dialyzer. Now there's the machine that circulates the blood, etc. cetera. Um, but the actual dialyzer, you can see it's a little replaceable cartridge. So dialysis can be done in the hospital, a dialysis unit, or at home. And again, we'll talk about some different access sites. So again, this is in the arm, leg, or groin. And so we have what you'll see in a patient's medical chart is AVF, or arteriovenous fistula. And so again, here we're joining an artery and a vein. We're kind of creating one gigantic capillary. You may also see an AVG. This is known as an arteriovenous graft, in which case we're using Teflon. And this is because we're having to replace or use, in essence, a plastic part um, because the, the patient's blood vessels are not adequate or can't support the fistula. And it's not uncommon to see a patient with a history of multiple fistula creations. Again, because of the high pressure and the frequent use of them, 
um, they often get damaged. So you may see they have to rotate sites or they're constantly replacing them. You may also see a central venous catheter, um, but this is just temporary in the hospital until the graft or the fistula is made, which is used for long-term hemodialysis. So for those of you who are, aren't familiar with dialysis, um, this is done three days a week for approximately four to six hours of treatment. So your schedule would be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. And then a clinic will have usually two to three shifts. So again, if it's a four hour treatment and three shifts, that's 12 hours of actual dialysis, plus a few hours for setup, disconnect, etc. The other major concern though is that a patient has to be able to travel to and from their dialysis sessions. So depending on transportation, if they're able to drive themselves, if they're in a nursing home, this can create some complications. Now currently Medicare does cover 80% of hemodialysis costs. Most private insurance companies do cover the costs. Um, and so this is, and it's uh, there's some long history to this law, um, but this goes back to the 80s to the Reagan administration. The original intent was that we'd be able to put people back to work part time. So we were looking at um, the health of the US economy. Again, it was supposed to help stimulate and allow people to work part time. Um, but the wording of the bill now looks at the fact that anyone with Medicare um, is eligible for hemodialysis. So when it comes to managing a patient's dialysis, um, there's actually a very, very large team. And so this team is at every dialysis clinic. So you may have seen the DeVita clinic. And so this is over next to the Just Move gym. And so of course you have the patient who drives the care. You'll have the technician and the nurse who are monitoring the patient's health, safety, and connecting them to the equipment. You have the nephrologist or physician who's overseeing the treatment and again is going to be monitoring the patient long term. A nephrology social worker, so again when it comes to resources, funding, transportation, that's all set up through the social worker. And of course the renal dietitian who looks at dietary compliance and lab work with the patient. So here you can see again the blood is taken out through the fistula goes to the dialyzer where it's going to be filtered. You can see that again, we need to maintain temperature. You'll then have the excreted dialyzed solution, which takes the place of urine. The blood is then made sure to stay nice and warm and is then put back into the patient's body. And so here you can again see how again, we've created in essence a giant capillary where we're going to come out through one end and then be reinserted back into the body. So we're going to come out of the artery, which is under high pressure, and then back into the vein, which is under lower pressure. And here you can see some of the different options for an AV fistula, a looped graft, which again uses Teflon because of the weak veins and arteries or you can see the temporary subclavian. And so again, here you can see hemodialysis. If you look at the machine and you see the cartridge that is vertical, so it's to the right of the machine and it looks like a plastic tube which actually has the blood coming in and out of it, that is the actual dialyzer. That's where the actual filtering occurs. Now, one of the things a dietitian does is they work with the diet patients on their diet compliance. So making sure they're actually following their diet correctly. And so here we have a study from Harum et al. And so their objective was to determine the most effective time for nutrition education for dialysis patients by looking at recall before, during, and after treatment. And so this was in 62 adult Hispanic dialysis patients. And they found that before treatment, subjects are better able to complete memory recall and cognitive function tests. As age increased, 
recall ability decreased, and as education level decreased, recall ability decreased. Now we can't control the last two, which is the age of our patients or their education level. But if we know they do best before treatment, then that is the best time to review their lab work and their diet with them. So as you meet patients who are on dialysis, many will report to you that after the session, they feel quote unquote whipped. They just wanna go home, lay on the couch, or go home and take a nap. Um, it is very rare that you have a patient who finishes dialysis, jumps up for joy and is, I'm ready to go start my day. Um, that is very uncommon. So usually people are exhausted. Um, they're definitely wiped out after a dialysis treatment. So here we can see that recall is best prior to dialysis. It is a, goes down during and is worse after the treatment. Now, as we mentioned previously, that the kidneys may filter 1,600 liters of fluid a day. That is, they are constantly filtering for you 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. When you go to dialysis, it's for 4 hours at a time, 3 days a week. This is not the same as having functioning kidneys. There are other techniques that attempt to mimic the frequency and get better results. This is known as peritoneal dialysis. So we've seen the peritoneal cavity previously when we looked at liver disease and ascites, where we had a buildup of fluid in the peritoneal cavity. Here, with peritoneal dialysis, we know that the peritoneal wall has a selective semi-permeable membrane. This membrane is very similar to what we want for filtration. So if we go back to that tea bag analogy when it comes to water passing through or having specific electrolytes passing through, we can in essence manipulate and use this peritoneal wall for our own purposes. Now there are two types of peritoneal dialysis, continuous ambulatory and continuous cycling. So access is made via catheter into the peritoneal cavity and the peritoneal cavity is slowly filled with diazolate via a catheter. Extra fluid and waste products are gonna be drawn out of the blood and into the fluid. So remember, because of the capillaries, the hepatic portal vein, right? We know there's a lot of blood flow to the abdomen. We will actually draw fluid and waste products through those membranes and into the peritoneal cavity. So we'll actually be, in essence, creating our own ascites. Um, but again, this is dialysis. So we're actually going to pull fluid into the peritoneal cavity. And now this can be achieved with a range of dextrose concentrations. So based on your blood and how much we need to remove from your blood, we can actually change the concentration of fluid placed in the peritoneal cavity. In addition to the concentration, we also have to focus on what's known as dwell time. And this is how long the fluid sits in the peritoneal cavity. So again, waste, chemicals, and fluid will pass from the capillaries in the lining of the peritoneal cavity into the diazolate. The typical dwell time for ambulatory peritoneal dialysis is four to six hours and no machine is required. For continuous cyclical peritoneal dialysis, a machine known as a cycler will fill and empty the abdomen three to five times during the night. So with ambulatory, four exchanges will be made during the day, one exchange will be made during the night, and that fluid will sit during the entire time the patient is sleeping. With the cycler, three to five exchanges are done per night, 
and one is done during the day. So this is done by a machine that changes the fluid throughout the night. Then one dwell is made so the patient can then go about their day, go to work, go to school, etc. Now we did say that we can use a variety of formulas including 1.5%, 2.5%, and 4.25% dextrose. Now you will absorb some of that dextrose into your bloodstream and we need to consider this if the patient also has diabetes. Here you see a graphical representation of the fluid inside the peritoneal cavity. So here we can see, again, this would be an ambulatory patient. This is without a cycler. So you can see the diazolate is filled into the peritoneal cavity. Again, there is a drain line with a waste solution. So the patient would then be able to remove the diazolate, cap it, and hold on to the waste solution, right? As long as this is tucked into a waistband, etc. They'll go about their day, and then when they need to, they'll drain it. So again, you can see here, so four to six hours, it's drained, and a new diazolate or new dwell is going to be placed, and fluid is going to be replaced in the peritoneal cavity. So the advantages of peritoneal dialysis because this is done every day and is done at home, we avoid the large fluctuations in blood chemistry. Dialysis, or specifically hemodialysis, is done three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Unfortunately, that means there's always one session which is done after two days, whereas the other sessions are done after one day of not receiving treatment. So what we see is a fluctuation in blood chemistry, which is the patient's lab values look worse during that two days without dialysis. Peritoneal dialysis is done every day at home and we avoid these large fluctuations. We can help maintain and protect renal function as long as possible. And again, because they're not visiting a center and this is done at home while they're sleeping or during the day, they can maintain a more normal lifestyle. Well, this sounds wonderful. Why don't we do this for everyone? So there are some side effects, which is there's the possible development of peritonitis, which is inflammation of the cavity membrane, hypotension that requires fluid and sodium, and the risk of weight gain. So as we said, there is absorption of glucose, so approximately four to 800 calories a day from the solution. Is absorbed. So nutrition therapy for chronic kidney disease. Again, we're frequently worried about these patients developing malnutrition with 20 to 70 percent of patients being found to have protein energy malnutrition. Other diagnostic statements that can be used include inadequate intake, excessive fluid intake, malnutrition, excessive mineral intake, so specifically based on their labs, potassium, phosphorus, or sodium, altered nutrition-related lab values, involuntary weight loss or gain, limited adherence if they're non-compliant with the diet, limited access or inability to prepare foods and meals. Again, because these patients are very exhausted, it's very difficult for them to cook, go grocery shopping, etc. So here you have a list of factors that contributes to malnutrition in patients with chronic kidney disease. Now we said again that our therapy is tailored based on the stage of chronic kidney disease. So for stages one and two, the focus is on comorbidities such as diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and cardiovascular disease, with our main goal to slow the progression so if we can improve blood glucose control, reduce blood pressure, and have a improved lipid profile, then we may be able to 
stop the progression of the chronic kidney disease. Now the nephrons do not regenerate. While the liver does, the liver does not regenerate. But we can stop it from getting worse, hopefully. So you'll have regular reassessments of these patients in one to three month intervals. For stage three and four patients, Again, we're going to be monitoring their albumin or subjective global assessment and a dietary interview. Again, the concern is that they will develop malnutrition. And again, we will talk about there are some evidence-based guidelines for these patients. Now, a low-protein diet is recommended if they're not on dialysis. And that is 0.6 to 0.75 grams per kilogram per day. Now, if there is a comorbidity that requires increased protein, we still provide protein. So if they're normal and the only thing wrong is kidney disease, they are low protein. But for example, if this patient is in a motor vehicle accident and they need a high protein diet to recover, we still provide the high protein diet because that is more dangerous and going to kill them before the chronic kidney disease. Additionally, these patients will need higher calories to prevent malnutrition at 35 calories per kilogram. Again, adequate protein, so monitoring lean body mass and serum protein. Monitor vitamins and minerals for abnormalities. And again, continue to monitor the lipid profile as we want a cardioprotective lipid profile. At stage five, our patients will begin dialysis. So for hemodialysis patients, we want a high protein diet with restriction of potassium, phosphorus, fluids, and sodium, and possibly monitoring and modifying total fat and cholesterol. So again, we are concerned about that lipid profile. The peritoneal dialysis diet is more liberalized. Again, still having higher amounts of protein, again with lower but still some limited amounts of sodium and potassium, fluid and phosphorus. So again for both diets we will monitor protein, calories, sodium, potassium, phosphorus, calcium, fluid, other vitamins and minerals as needed, and fiber. Again both diets do place some restriction on those electrolytes, but they are less restricted on peritoneal dialysis. Here is a sheet that I would recommend you place in your pocket guide. Um, it breaks it down very well. Um, it's very easy to understand and has all major stages and conditions. So for stage five chronic kidney disease, it's actually counterintuitive. For stage four, we went low protein, but for stage five, we want high protein at greater than or equal to 1.2 grams per kilogram, and at least 50% of this being high biological value. That's going to be egg, meat, or dairy. For peritoneal dialysis, it's the same except during cases of peritonitis where we will further increase it. For calories, again, we will actually increase calories in stage five chronic kidney disease. The only concern is that with peritoneal dialysis, you need to account for the calories from the diazolate. This is approximately 60% of the glucose will be absorbed. Uh, usually is about 400 to 800 calories, depending on the exact regimen. Now you'll see at the bottom, 24 to 27 calories per kilogram is the actual, that is the actual average intake. The recommended is 35 calories per kilogram per day. So patients are significantly under eating compared to what they need. And this is why so many dialysis patients develop malnutrition. 
Again, with fat, we're concerned about their lipid profile. CKD patients are at an increased risk for coronary artery disease and stroke. Hemodialysis patients will typically have normal LDL, HDL, and triglycerides, while peritoneal dialysis patients will have elevated total cholesterol, LDL, and triglycerides. And this is very simply for the reason the fact that they have an increased glucose or sugar intake. This is no different than if you were to consume that sugar orally, you see the altered lipid profile. We recommend, though, a cardiovascular protective diet, so the DASH or TLC diet, for both peritoneal and hemodialysis. Now, these do have to be adjusted, again, for fruit and vegetable intake, etc., um, but we do focus on those cardiovascular guidelines in chronic kidney disease patients. Now, I will show you during the Zoom session the adjusted edema-free body weight for obese and underweight patients per the Kodoki guidelines. Um, I will not expect you to do this, but you may be asked about it on the RD exam. So I will not ask you, but it could be asked of you by a preceptor or the RD exam. And so here we see the TLC restrictions that recommend for our specific types of fat, saturated, polyunsaturated, and monounsaturated along with cholesterol, carbohydrate, fat, and protein recommendations. If you would like to look ahead, here we have the formula for adjusted body weight. The biggest concern is standard body weight, and I will show you how to use that. That comes from a chart, and there is no way you can do it without the chart. So you are not there's not something you have not been taught. It's not something that you're missing. Um, it can only be completed with the chart, and I will show you how to use that chart. For those with stage 5, we do limit potassium to 2 to 3 grams per day. This may be more stringent if the patient's producing no urine, and we want their labs to stay within the range of 3.5 to 5. We want to see if there's any other causes for the hyperkalemia, including another medication. And again, we're going to educate and counsel the patient on avoiding high potassium foods. There is no restriction for patients with peritoneal dialysis, as we can remove the potassium through the daily filtration. Fluid and sodium should be individualized based on residual urine output and the type of dialysis. One thing we do monitor is what's known as interdialytic weight gain, or how much weight the patient gains between sessions. So the average is two to four kilograms and should not exceed 5% of the patient's body weight. We recommend that most patients start with a two gram sodium diet and no more than one liter of fluid per day. The one liter fluid restriction is usually the cause for the most non-compliance in dialysis patients. An alternative order may read 500 milliliters plus urine output. So while they may have failing kidneys, they may still be producing some urine, in which case it's 500 milliliters plus the amount they're still able to excrete per day. If their urine output is over one liter, then sodium and fluid may be liberalized to increased numbers. In peritoneal dialysis, this will be based on ultrafiltration with 2 to 2.5 kilograms of fluid removed per day. The fluid restriction is less severe. So in hemodialysis, it's one liter per day. In peritoneal, it is two liters per day. The sodium restriction, again, is more liberal at two to four grams per day. If the peritoneal dialysis patient gains too much fluid weight, it will require a higher diazolate concentration to be used, which can be effective, but this will be an increased amount of glucose absorbed, higher triglycerides, and possibly the development of insulin resistance long-term. 
In both patient populations, signs of fluid overload include shortness of breath, hypertension, CHF, and edema. Here's a list of tips for helping patients control their fluid intake. Limiting high salt foods, taking pills at the same time as mealtime liquids, i.e. we don't use separate glasses of water to take our medicine, we simply take it at the same time that we would be eating. Drinking from small glasses or cups as it prevents us from over drinking, drinking only when thirsty, Cold beverages quench thirst better than room temperature or warm beverages. Checking daily weight to monitor compliance with the fluid restriction. Sour candy or sugar-free gum, so again this would be only a little sour, can help moisten the mouth. Small amounts of lemon juice to the water. Swishing cold water in the mouth but not swallowing, so you would be spitting it out. Again, we are concerned about oral hygiene, so brushing teeth often. Keeping the lips moist with lip balm. Using ice cubes instead of liquids. And so these would be something you would then put the ice cube in your cheek, suck on it for a long period of time. It's still the same total amount of liquid. You're simply stretching it out over a longer period of time. And frozen grapes. Again, they have less water than pure water or an ice cube. But again, they obviously do, still do count for fluid content. For chronic kidney disease stage 5, we are concerned about phosphorus, and so we see hyperphosphatemia with a GFR at 20 to 30 milliliters per minute. So again, this is actually before stage 5, so we see high phosphorus levels in stage 4, and so we have to treat this in stage 5. Five. And so we have a dietary phosphorus restriction of 800 to 1,000 milligrams per day, or less than 17 milligrams per kilogram of ideal body weight. This is in both hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis patients. Now the way we do this is in addition to a dietary restriction, the patient consumes phosphate binders with every meal. We know previously when we discussed, and it was usually to our detriment, that the absorption of minerals is decreased when you take multiple minerals at once as they compete for absorption and or they bind with substances in food. In this case, that's what we want to have happen. So we will purposely take a medication to bind with the phosphorus and prevent its absorption. Now I can tell you though that the cheapest phosphate binder, and we know this previously from our A&P, is Tums or calcium carbonate. Imagine taking three to four Tums after every meal and that mouthful of chalk. The problem with this is that especially when you're on a severe fluid restriction and you're now asked to take chalky medicine with every single meal is that phosphate binders have very poor compliance and the patients refuse to use them. Now Tums, which is calcium based, is the first one but not the only one. There are other binders, including Renvella, Foslo, Renagel, and Fosrenol. And despite the name gel and all being in there, um, they are not liquids, they are tablets. So now that we've reviewed phosphorus, let's take a look at calcium. So again, we said that we could use calcium to bind the phosphorus. So calcium requirements are higher in patients with chronic kidney disease, and they typically have low calcium levels due to that lack of active vitamin D. So this, active, this loss of active vitamin D causes a decreased absorption in the gut. And again, we typically have high phosphorus levels. And remember that, kit, that calcium and phosphorus compete. So what we do is we restrict foods high in calcium incidentally as the foods are also high in phosphorus. For example, dairy, which is a very convenient and concentrated source of calcium, is also high in phosphorus. So we do provide the patients with calcium supplements, and again, certain phosphate binders, including Tums and Foslo, are calcium-based. We still want to limit the total calcium intake to 2,000 milligrams per day from all sources. You'll notice, though, that this number is increased from the normal recommendations. 
looking at other vitamins and minerals. So we do recommend a water-soluble vitamin for patients with chronic kidney disease, and you will see there are specific renal vitamins, and these include B12, folic acid, vitamin C, um, and these are usually things like nephrocaps, nephrovite, etc. And what they're going to do is they're going to be not containing right, the phosphorus and the calcium, as this will be controlled with a secondary supplement. These patients, again, we know will also be receiving vitamin D or calcitriol, which is going to be the active form of vitamin D. And mineral supplementation, again, we're going to avoid magnesium-containing phosphate binders, antacids, and supplements. And we are concerned with iron deficiency in both hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. Again, our primary concern is that anemia of chronic disease due to a lack of erythropoietin to stimulate the bone marrow. Here you can see a sample menu, and it has some of the common recommendations. So to clarify, your hospital may have a quote-unquote renal diet. However, there is no such thing as a standardized renal diet. The diet you that you find at a hospital is going to be determined based on that RD staff and the medical director. So a normal quote-unquote renal diet is going to be 2 gram sodium, 2 gram potassium, 1 gram phos. So that's 2,000, 2,000, and 1,000. It will also usually be high protein as it is intended for patients that are on hemodialysis. However, it varies facility to facility. Some facilities will see the renal diet as the pre-dialysis diet and they will have a low protein diet. So please check for whichever facility you are at if they do have a quote unquote renal diet that you know what that means and that the staff also knows what that means. So you'll see in this sample menu, we recommend limiting dairy to one serving per day. It is a great source of calcium and high biological value protein, but unfortunately it's very high in phosphorus as well. You can see under it says fruit or fruit juice. Fruits and vegetables need to be limited, and this is due to potassium concerns. But again, this is still at six servings per day. Now, some fruits are much higher in potassium, and this is why you will see in the hospital is that typically orange juice is excluded from the renal diet. You'll see that total fluids are limited to that one liter per day unless otherwise ordered and sodium you can see is limited to 2,000 milligrams per day. With these patients, we're going to be monitoring their outcomes, including their lab values, their blood counts, anthropometrics, and clinical signs and symptoms. From a behavior standpoint, we're concerned with meal planning, meeting their nutrient needs, their long-term education and awareness of potential interactions, that is, which foods they can eat, and which foods they cannot eat, can they recall this and explain it back to you, as well as their physical activity levels. Now, our major concern is not just with chronic kidney disease. And so what we are also focused on is comorbidities or other sicknesses. The primary one being cardiovascular disease, as the patient is more likely to die from cardiovascular disease than they are from, to progress to stage four chronic kidney disease. So you're more likely in essence to have a heart attack or a stroke before you get to hemodialysis. Again, we know that diseases tend to cluster, which is if you have one, you'll probably have others. It is possible, but unusual for a patient to have nothing else wrong with their body and be in stage five chronic kidney disease. It is possible, but not common. So 50% of deaths in hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis patients are due to cardiovascular disease with a high prevalence of heart failure, left ventricular hypertrophy, and atherosclerosis in chronic kidney disease. We're not sure of a mechanism, but we believe there is possibly accelerated atherogenesis, which is the disease itself increases your risk of developing cardiovascular disease. We also see elevated CRP, which is linked to increased cardiovascular death. 
Now, we've alluded to this previously, but we also will talk about secondary hyperparathyroidism. So this is another disease that causes hyperparathyroidism. In this case, that quote-unquote other disease is chronic kidney disease and a lack of active vitamin D. This leads to a form of severe intractable bone disease and high levels of, PT, of PTH cause ostitis fibrosa cystica. This is a form of bone disease characterized by rapid turnover with excessive collagen production and inadequate mineralization, resulting in poor bone quality and high fracture risk. So remember that the bone is a layer of protein that is then mineralized or has minerals added to it. In this case, the bone is still formed with the collagen, the protein is there, but it is not mineralized correctly, right? So the bones are going to not be strong enough to resist fracture. The treatment is to resist, I apologize, restrict dietary phosphorus, a surgical parathyroidectomy or removal of the parathyroid, and supplementation of active vitamin D. And that is why those restriction of phosphorus and the vitamin D are standard procedure in patients with chronic kidney disease. We've spoken previously about anemia of chronic disease. And so again, this is due to a lack of erythropoietin, which is produced in the kidneys and stimulates the bone marrow to produce red blood cells. This is treated with recombinant human erythropoietin and iron. And so this is a form of genetically modified erythropoietin. So this is done through, and I'm not sure if anyone did this in biology or you might have done the simulated lab, but again, similar to the way that human insulin is made by E. coli, we have reprogrammed bacteria to produce EPO. For patients with dialysis, EPO can be given in IV lines while they're receiving dialysis. It can also be given though subcutaneously, which is common practice for patients with peritoneal dialysis. The other major concern is that as good as dialysis is, during the dialysis process, some blood will be left in the dialyzer and in the tubing itself. So if you are going to dialysis three days a week, you are slowly losing blood. We need to make sure that you can regenerate blood cells at the same rate you are losing them. Now again, we've talked about this funding, and so Part B for Medicare covers medical nutrition therapy for renal disease, non-dialysis, and diabetes. So for patients who are not on dialysis, they can go and see a dietitian and fix their diet, but once they're on dialysis, it's not covered, which is very strange. Now, part of it is, is that the dialysis services themselves are reimbursed. And so all dialysis clinics still have a dietitian on staff to ensure that they hit their target goals and receive government reimbursement. But the dietitian's work themselves is not reimbursed. It is only reimbursed before they have stage five chronic kidney disease and before they receive dialysis. All right, so we'll move on to a different disease and we'll talk about acute kidney injury. And so here the kidneys stop functioning suddenly with a decrease in GFR and a buildup of that nitrogenous waste. So stress or injury induces a hypercatabolic state. The patient's status declines rapidly with a loss in lean body mass and toxicity related symptoms, again, from that poisoning, from the buildup of urea and nitrogenous waste. This was formerly called acute renal failure, and you may see some doctors still listed as such, and this occurs in 1% of all hospitalized patients. So the etiology or the cause behind these acute kidney injuries, there are three types. This is inadequate renal perfusion, so this is something that reduces perfusion to the kidneys and can cause pre-renal azotemia. And so by perfusion, we mean there's a lack of fluid moving through the kidneys. This can be due simply due to dehydration, so severe dehydration. When you hear about um, hikers or people who are lost in the woods and they 
uh, are suffering from exposure, right? So in addition to all the other physical symptoms, right, the long-term dehydration is going to damage the kidneys. You have acute tubular necrosis in which ischemia damages the epithelial cells, causing death of the kidney cells and renal failure. We have intrinsic, which is a disease or damage of anatomical structure to the kidneys. For example, certain antibiotics are very toxic to the kidneys. Uh, this is things like mushrooms, etc., that are dangerous and toxic to the kidneys. We'll talk about so glomerulonephritis and Chagrin syndrome. And we also have obstructive, which is a blockage of the ureter or neck of the bladder. This is due to causes such as kidney stones, blood clots, or tumors. So pre-renal acute kidney injury leads to a lack of blood flow. Again, we have uremic symptoms and death of the cells. The four phases of acute kidney injury include initiation, with a decline in GFR, extension, during which ischemia and inflammatory damage continues, maintenance, when GFR will reach its lowest level, and recovery, where the epithelial cells regenerate. Depending on how well and how quickly the acute kidney injury is treated, you may recover some renal function. However, this is not like the liver, which can regenerate large portions of the organ, and typically after an acute kidney injury, the GFR will always be slightly impaired. So clinical manifestations include less than 500 milliliters of urine being produced, fluid and electrolyte disorders, azotemia, and wasting. So we know that again, similar to the patient who has chronic kidney disease, we'll see an elevation in potassium, mag, and FOS, as the patient is unable to excrete these through the urine. BUN and creatinine will both be elevated, although they may maintain a normal ratio. So they'll both be elevated, but they'll go up at the same time with a normal ratio. The treatment is to identify the underlying cause and treat it. So if there's an obstruction, if there's been exposure to toxins, etc. So we'll talk about the patient may need dialysis or CRRT. And we'll talk about that in upcoming slides. That is continuous renal replacement therapy. So continuous renal replacement therapy is used in the ICU setting for severe fluid overload. So this must be supervised and is similar to hemodialysis, but much riskier. But in essence, if your kidneys have been temporarily damaged, we can take over their function on a short term notice and give them time to recover. So sessions last between 12 to 24 hours and are done daily. So unlike dialysis, which is performed for short periods of time, three days a week, this is done daily for long periods of time to protect the kidneys and allow them to recover. If we need to, we can remove up to two liters of fluid per hour. Now this is very aggressive, but this is because typically, right, if the kidneys have not been functioning, you are not a dialysis patient, and there's been a significant buildup of fluid in the body. There are technically different forms of CRRT, including continuous venovenous hemofiltration and continuous venovenous hemodialysis, um, but that's beyond the scope of what we need to know, other than if you have a patient in the ICU receiving any form of CRRT, they are in essence, right, having a severe acute renal injury and they are likely having acute fluid overload. So we're doing everything we can to protect the kidneys and remove the fluid back to baseline as quickly as possible. So our nutrition interventions for acute kidney injury, typically this is short lived. So either it will progress, in which case the patient's going to become a chronic kidney disease patient, or it will be short lived and will complete treatment. So it often requires no specific nutrition intervention. Um, the only thing that we do focus on is protein and energy needs. Again, we know that protein can be damaging to the kidneys, but again, we have to look at the underlying cause. For example, in secondary infections, tissue damage, is this due to a physical damage to the kidney, etc. in which case the patient may still need elevated protein to recover, but 
if it's simply due to toxic exposure, etc., we would actually want to use low protein. So you've got to use your best common sense and judgment in this situation. Again, oral nutrition, if possible, may need enteral nutrition, which again is dependent on the cause of the acute kidney injury. But we typically recommend lower protein at 0.5 to 0.8 grams per kilogram if they are not on dialysis. 1 to 2 grams per kilogram if they are on dialysis and 1.5 to 2.5 grams per kilogram if they're on continuous renal replacement therapy. The patient will have elevated calorie needs at 30 to 40 calories per kilogram per day. This is based on dry weight. Do not include their edematous or their fluid weight. And we will monitor their fluid status and limit their sodium. Again, this will be tightly controlled, especially if they are receiving CRRT, in which case you will be able to see their eyes and O's and how much fluid is being removed from the patient. So we'll talk now about some other diseases of the kidneys. So these are diseases of the tubules and interstitium. So chronic interstitial nephritis. We have swelling between the renal tubules causing the inability to concentrate urine, in which case the patient will be urinating a lot, but it's very dilute. And of course, to compensate for this, we need extra fluid so they do not become dehydrated. We have what's known as Fanconi syndrome, which is a disorder of the proximal tubules, causing inability to reabsorb the proper amount of glucose, amino acids, phosphate, and bicarbonate, causing these to be excreted in the urine. And you guessed it, our solution is to replace that fluid, bicarbonate, potassium, phosphate, calcium, and vitamin D. Renal tubular acidosis is a defect in the distal tubule or proximal tubule, causing kidneys not to be able to excrete acid into the urine, resulting in acidic blood pH. And so here, distal RTA is treated with bicarb. So again, we want to counteract the excessive acid or hydrogen ions with bicarb. Now you probably are familiar with pyelonephritis, but you haven't called it that. But this is simply a kidney infection. Now you may have heard, and I'm sure many are familiar with the cranberry juice can be beneficial when it comes to the development of UTIs, but it actually extends past that. And this is real cranberry juice, not cranberry juice cocktail, but real cranberry juice can help with bladder and kidney infections. And our current working theory is that concentrated tannins or pranthocyanidins in cranberry and blueberry juice help inhibit the adherence of E. coli to epithelial cells. In which case, right, we're basically turning the kidneys and the bladder into a slip and slide so that E. coli cannot take hold and cause an infection. Glomerular diseases include nephritic syndrome, which is characterized by inflammation of the capillary loops of the glomerulus, resulting in blood in the urine, hypertension, and a mild loss of renal function. Nephrotic syndrome is a group of diseases caused by damage to the glomeruli, resulting in large molecules of protein and red blood cells to leak into the urine. And so signs and symptoms include low albumin in the blood as it's leaking into the kit through the kidneys at a faster rate than it should and edema and our medical nutrition therapy to treat this is a restriction of sodium to two grams per day or less diuretics to minimize edema and to control protein intake and limit it to 0.8 to one gram per kilogram per day to decrease the amount of protein leaking out into the urine. We also have end-stage renal disease. Here the kidney is unable to excrete waste products, maintain fluid and electrolyte balance, and produce hormones. So this sounds very similar to chronic kidney disease, and at the end stage, essentially, it is. But what we do have is a different cause. So chronic kidney disease built up over time, end-stage renal disease. Um, again, we have some other factors at play. 
So we do have uremia, again, that buildup of nitrogenous waste with the nausea and vomiting, weakness, muscle cramps, itching, the metallic taste, and neurological impairment. And so what you'll see is a BUN over 100 and creatinine over 10. And similar to stage 5 chronic kidney disease, the treatment for end-stage renal disease is a transplant or dialysis. So our goal is to prevent deficiency and maintain good nutrition status through adequate protein, calorie, vitamin, and mineral intake, control edema and electrolyte imbalances by monitoring sodium, potassium, and fluid, prevent the development of renal osteodystrophy, focusing on those micronutrients, calcium, phosphorus, and vitamin D, while still enabling the patient to eat a diet that's palatable and attractive while fitting within their lifestyle as much as possible, coordinating patient care with families, dietitians, nurses, physicians, acute care, outpatient staff, and skilled nursing facilities, and again, initial nutrition education with periodic counseling and long-term monitoring. These patients may need nutrition support, in which case we do have specialized formulas. For Abbott, this is Nepro, which is a play on the word nephro, nephro, very clever. And Nova Source Renal, very easy to identify from Nestle. Other options may be parenteral nutrition. And we can actually feed someone at the same time that we would do dialysis. And this is intradialytic parenteral nutrition, in which case I can actually give you a thousand calories during your hemodialysis treatment. And intraperitoneal nutrition where again, I can actually give you protein instead of glucose when I'm performing peritoneal dialysis. Now we said that long-term treatment for both stage five chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease is kidney transplant. So to give you an example of some numbers at one point, so 96,645 were on the transplant list in 2013. 16,812 transplants took place in 2012. Now, one thing to realize is that many times when we talk about essential organs is that, of course, they're cadaverous. So, which is, I cannot remove someone's heart and give someone a heart transplant and both patients live. I know it seems a little obvious, but just to make sure we understand, certain organs can be donated while you're still alive, others cannot. So heart transplants, lung transplants, etc. come from cadaverous donors. Kidney transplants can come from living donors or deceased donors. You only need one kidney to live, but again, it does come with some risk should anything happen to that kidney. So of those 16,812 transplants, 11,043 were from deceased donors, 5,769 from living donors. Now we have what's known as the major histocompatibility complex, which determines the acceptability for transplant. As with all transplants, we are concerned that the immune system will recognize the organ as foreign and attack it. And similar to all previously discussed transplants, the patient will be on a lifelong immunosuppression regimen. So again, this is indicated for patients with end-stage renal disease and CKD stage 5. And this includes other causes such as polycystic kidney disease, severe diabetes, infections, glomerulosclerosis, lupus, and inborn errors of metabolism. So patients who are not eligible for kidney transplants include those with cardiac and pulmonary insufficiency, those with liver disease, tobacco or other substance abuse, morbid obesity, psychiatric disorders, incurable terminal infections or cancer, and those that are advanced age. Again, as you saw, we had almost 100,000 people on the list with less than 20% per year actually receiving transplant. Um, kidneys are not easy to come by. And so again, there is 
uh, a very strict criteria for who can qualify to make sure that they get the most use out of it and protect the kidney and use it for as long as possible. So as we discussed, there are two types of kidney transplants, those from living donors, which can be related or unrelated, and those from non-living donors or cadaveric, which are unrelated. Now, depending on the quality and the health of the donation, the new kidney should begin functioning immediately. Kidneys from living donors typically require three to five days to reach normal functioning levels, while those from cadaveric donors may need seven to 15 days to reach normal functioning levels. Now, what's incredible to me about this is that they will take a kidney out of someone, prep you for surgery, put the new kidney in your body, and you will typically leave the hospital in less than a week. So we performed major surgery, opened you up, added a new organ to your body, and you will leave in less than a week. Now again, we said this requires a lifelong immunosuppression regimen, and there's many drugs in this family. The most famous one, and we've discussed the side effects of it, are prednisone, but you can see the others listed. Now again, um, this is going to be determined by the nephrologist, in which case they're going to be taking a look at, uh, you know, they may need a dose of this one, a little dose of that one, um, right, or some combination that to get the optimal immunosuppression, um, but again, still being able to fight off any secondary infections, but still accepting the kidney. So from a nutrition standpoint, we're concerned with is we have the acute phase, which is the first eight weeks following transplant, and the chronic phase, where we're looking at after nine weeks. And so here is a very nice chart. I would recommend placing this in your pocket guide should you encounter any patients with transplants. Some of our clinical rotation sites do do transplants. I think this chart kind of sums it up nicely and makes it very easy to see. In the acute phase, we're still recovering from surgery. So you'll see there's elevated protein needs. And then after we've recovered from surgery, you'll see again that there'll actually be a decrease in protein. For the most part, the micronutrients are very similar, um, though potassium actually has no restriction after you've entered the chronic phase. So again, we said that for the first six to eight weeks after transplant, we're going to see increased protein and calories at 30 to 35 calories per kilogram. And protein somewhere between 1.2 to 1.5 grams of protein per kilogram. After eight weeks, this decreases to one gram of protein per kilogram. And again, adequate calories. Now we do know, especially when we're taking a look at other macronutrient sources, is that there may be some glucose intolerance and the patient may need supplementary, supplementary insulin. Again, we know, especially with high doses of prednisone, that we will have insulin resistance. We still want to recommend a low-fat diet. Again, we're concerned with the development of cardiovascular disease and sodium, right, restricting it to 2 to 3 grams per day as hypertension is common in this patient population. Now, I know some people are thinking, isn't the upper limit 2300? Yes. But again, we have to look at what's optimal for this patient and what we can get with compliance. If I can get them to two, that would be amazing. But realizing if there's somebody's eating six a day, if I can get them to three, I'll still see significant benefits to their transplant. But my goal is always to get below that tolerable upper limit. Potassium is restricted in the first eight weeks, and then there should be no restriction unless there's any other comorbidities or other issues. We may see hypo or low magnesium levels as immunosuppressants can cause magnesium wasting, in which case we would need to supplement magnesium. And supplementation of magnesium has been shown to lower LDL and lipoprotein B in renal transplant patients. So again, we said these immunosuppressants are going to prevent rejection. And we know from our previous lecture we took a look at drug nutrient interactions that we need to avoid grapefruit and grapefruit juice. 
Now we said historically, again, you're more likely to die from cardiovascular disease than you are to advance to chronic kidney disease. Even after a transplant, you are still at risk. At 70% of transplant patients will present with dyslipidemia. So again, we're gonna be focused on that cholesterol management diet and lipid lowering medications may be necessary. Again, with obesity, weight gain is common and may complicate the glucose intolerance and hyperlipidemia. We know that the prednisone will increase appetite. Again, diet, exercise, and behavior modification will be necessary. So in the transplant patient, taking a look at calcium, phosphorus, and bone metabolism. So osteoporosis and altered vitamin D are significant problems for patients after the kidney transplant. Again, the long-term prednisone or corticosteroid use will require the supplementation of calcium and vitamin D. This can cause to be an ex increased excretion of calcium in the urine. Increased phosphorus will be necessary as the immunosuppressants will cause an increase in urinary phosphate excretion. And again, we'll monitor potassium, but as long as the lab values are normal, there's no need for restriction. During periods of rejection, or if rejection occurs, corticosteroids will be increased to again decrease immune function or immunosuppress. Then we'll see a need for increased protein and calorie due to catabolism during this rejection period in which case calorie and protein needs will both go back up 30 to 35 calories per kilogram and 1.3 to 1.5 grams of protein per kilogram. So with end stage renal disease, and we've talked about the transplant, we then also need to work with and speak with patients. So as we've discussed is that Dialysis is covered for 80% by Medicare, which affects most seniors. That being said, I hope it's made clear through this lecture, dialysis is not an easy or always enjoyable process. We're looking at significant lifestyle changes. We're looking at a heavy medication regimen, changes in quality of life. We need to have these conversations and again, our goal is not to be judgmental or influenced, but to present accurate information. So if a patient does need dialysis or they've had, they have long, they have end stage renal disease or over a long period of time, they've developed chronic kidney disease stage five, we kind of have to have that conversation of what is the long-term goal. So again, we need to speak with the patient and family again, we can provide dialysis for anyone, but is that the best option? If somebody's in their 70s, they're leading an active lifestyle, um, you know, they're still uh, engaged, they've got a lot going on in their life, they've got a lot to look forward to, grandkids, etc. Dialysis is probably a very good decision. However, you know, the thing, it gets a little trickier if the patient's 95, bed bound, very poor quality of life. Um, you know, the patient is already complaints of severe pain or they're miserable before they start dialysis, right? I can keep you alive on machines for a very long period of time. That doesn't mean that's what the patient wants. And so again, we need to have sometimes those hard conversations of, you know, there's really, and at that age, you're not really eligible for a transplant. So if we start dialysis, there's no going back. This is the way it's going to be moving forward. So again, having clear, realistic expectations for what the treatment can provide and also the what kind of burdens it will place, how this can be managed, et cetera. So we do have the IDT team requires a dietitian. And should you be interested in renal treatments, there is a board certification for a specialty in renal nutrition. Now, your patient may decide they do not want to pursue dialysis. So again, this is a patient who, again, depending on the circumstances, if they have a other terminal illness, uh, they have severe cancer, severe heart disease, you know, with uh, heart failure, 
etc. Again, it's within their rights to refuse a medical treatment. If that is the case, we would advise them to avoid, right, or to, con to avoid high protein. So they should be on a low protein diet, low sodium diet, to help minimize or delay the effects of the kidney failure. So this is terminal and this will kill you, but again, we're looking at managing the symptoms and making them as comfortable as possible. All right, so let's take a look at some review questions. So patients with renal disease should consume what type of protein? And so we discussed, so this is high biological value. So again, this is that animal source where again, we're focused on eggs and meat and at least 50% should be high biological value. In end-stage renal disease, malaise, weakness, nausea and vomiting, muscle cramps, the itch, and a metallic taste in the mouth are caused by, and this is answer choice C, uremia. You may also have seen this previously in the slides as azotemia. So this is that buildup of urea or nitrogenous waste. And again, it's going to depend on the timing for the physician's education. In patients treated using dialysis, so using dialysis, sodium intake is, as answer choice, C, restricted. So it's specifically restricted to 2,000 milligrams per day. The diets of patients with end-stage renal disease should be, this is answer choice A, high in calcium and low in phosphorus. Remember these are natural opposites and we know that we want to specifically bind or remove phosphorus from the diet. Lastly, the most important factor in medical nutrition therapy for nephrolithiasis or kidney stones is and that is answer choice D, a high fluid intake to increase urine production. So there are some websites if you're seeking more information about renal disease and its treatment. Um, they actually have some ed excellent educational materials, both for practitioners as well as at the patient level. Thank you.